So, good afternoon. Uh, thanks very much for attending this session. My name is David Evans. Uh, I work for a small specialist consultancy called Neary. Uh, it's essentially myself, Gordy Advantage, the author of a book, or a couple of books, uh, including the title of this session, Specification by Example. Um, now, a, a 90 minute session is it's a slightly unusual format. It's not a very common session at uh, conferences. Obviously, you've always got typical 45 minute talks, or you've got workshops and so forth. Um, and this is kind of a little bit in between. So, it is a, an experiment for me because I haven't done this format before. So, my timing might be at risk. <laughs> we'll see how we go. The point, however, is that uh, 90 minutes are definitely too long for you to be sat there listening to me talk at you. Uh, it's a little short for us to sort of get properly into workshops, but given that it's not too large a group, uh, I'm hoping that we can focus on uh, uh, some interactive exercise for this, because for this topic, uh, it could be argued that the theory behind it is actually pretty straightforward. The difficulty is in how do you how to actually do this? You know, all the, all the questions seem to arise when you actually try it out for yourself. So I'm going to give us a couple of opportunities to try things out to, uh, um, the central premise, if you like, or the central thesis of specification by example is pretty straightforward. And I tend to sum it up just with this little diagram. So uh, it's really the, the, the basis that uh, being able to use concrete examples, being able to use examples that our business people, the users of our software, would use in their uh, uh, descriptions of expected behavior or expected software requirements is a very natural thing for people to do, and yet we don't really treat examples as first order items in our process. We tend to think of examples as just a means to an end. You know, it, you, you, you might have a, a business analyst or someone like that going and talking to users to understand the way their, their process works, and they'll say, well, for example, I would do this or that, and it's, oh, okay, right, Give me another example. Well, under this circumstance, it might do something different. And they generalize the rules out of that. Well, that's fine. That's what we need to do because we need to end up software that satisfies the general rule. The trouble is, those examples tend to just be thrown away because we've now got a much more uh, formal uh, specification or analysis document uh, that, that just covers the general case. Of course, the problem is that when we've got that general specification, uh, somebody needs to turn that into code, so you tend to need to think in concrete terms when you're actually doing your design, you need to understand well, what, would, what, what are the actual cases by which this would be used. Um, so you might be inventing examples in your head for that process. Similarly, software gets handed off to uh, testers, what do they need to do? Well, they need to come up with examples for uh, use as test cases. What are, what are some, some uh, example scenarios I could put this software through in order to test that I've satisfied the requirements. Once again, we're sort of treating the examples at each point as a temporary throwaway thing. And everyone's sort of reinventing different sets of examples without sort of having a common viewpoint. So specification by example is really just a simple idea of saying, what if we preserved those examples that we used as a discussion with the users or the stakeholders in the first place as first order items in that process? What if we actually gave them some importance and care and preserve them such that they can inform all of the steps in our process from design, implementation, and testing. So this little triangle is commonly used as the, the summary of, of SPE. It's that you know, it's showing this dual relationship that examples have in being able to clarify what we mean when we talk about our general software requirements. But if expressed in the right way and expressed with the right level of detail, those same examples that are you know, just useful for, for getting a shared understanding can actually be used as the same test cases that would verify that we can in fact satisfy those requirements when we do the implementation. That's a very say, simple uh, uh, idea of SP. <clears throat> Content of this session is about taking that simple idea and showing that there are a number of uh, useful patterns that emerge from that. Um, and 
these patterns are really uh, what we've seen good teams uh, use um, in applying the ideas of SPE or BED, accepted session development, some other things. Because sometimes people say, well, you know, isn't what is the difference between SPE and BED? It's a very common question. Um, uh, and we like to say, well, at its, at its heart, it's the same idea, but SPE sort of encompasses a number of patterns that you might sort of say, well, you're not doing, you know, that's not BED if you're just doing that. If you're just talking in terms of examples, then that's not BED. Um, or if you're you know, just using a particular type of test automation tool, well, that's not a proper BED tool. You get a lot of you know, uh, uh, concerns or, or, or questions like that. We're saying, well, as long as you're uh, adopting some of these patterns, then you, you, know, you could arguably say that you're doing uh, SP. So what are those patterns? Well, in a, in a nutshell, it's, it's, this is the, the sort of site. <coughs> and be <coughs> careful to point out that this is not, a, uh, not meant to be a process flow. As I say, very few teams actually succeed in doing all of these things consistently all the time. What we do see is teams that say, well, we major on this particular pattern, we major on this particular aspect uh, in order to, to help us succeed. And I'm hoping that what you'll find from here, if you're already you know, uh, doing something like acceptance test driven development or BED, that you might sort of be able to see some of the reasons why you might be struggling or why it might not be working as effectively as you'd like. Maybe it's because some of the patterns in this set are things that your organization you know, uh, it wasn't sort of consciously addressing or, uh, or hasn't really been able to uh, overcome. So in very, very quick terms, one starts sort of here at around about uh, 11 o'clock with a business goal or some kind of desired effect for uh, a given period of time, whether that's a release period or whether it's a sprint. Typically, it's something a little higher. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's some kind of business milestone. And uh, the pattern of deriving scope from goals is what turns that consciously into items of work that a, a delivery team can actually pick up. So typically, that's going to be user stories if you uh, using an agile process, but it could be something, you know, some equivalent or similar thing like use cases. Um, and that sort of conscious uh, linking of the business goal to the scope is the important uh, part of that pattern. <clears throat> the next sort of pattern, well, it's really a pair of patterns. It's being able to specify collaboratively when we take each of those items and need to get to the details of them. And in doing so, we illustrate the important details with concrete examples. So specifying collaboratively and illustrating with examples is what we do with our, our user stories, and from those we derive key examples that help us to understand or get to a, a common understanding of what's important in each of those. There's a subsequent pattern of refining a specification. That's where the key examples, which really are just a very low fidelity thing, typically these are things we might create on a whiteboard going through a couple of exercises like that today to see what we mean. Um, we need to be able to turn that into something that is a little more long-lived, you know, something that actually uh, can serve a few more purposes. So the thing that we create out of that is a specification supported by examples, a specification with examples. So it's simply a style that sort of blends some plain language descriptions of what our business rules are, supported by concrete examples that illustrate those, those rules. Um, the pattern down the, across the bottom there is probably what people are most familiar with if they're thinking BDD or ATDD, and that's the actual sort of uh, creating automated tests out of these things. The thing that the pattern that we sort of stress as important here is that we're automating validation without changing the specifications. That is, whatever was useful as documentation, whatever was very readable and understandable uh, uh, at this point, when we've refined into something, something. Uh, strong, that should be the same thing that becomes our, our automated test. That's what we like to say that what we're creating is not just automated test, but executable specification. Specification is self checking. Um, and then the final sort of pattern of evolving uh, a documentation system and validating frequently or validating continuously is what allows us to get from a, you know, sets of individual executable specifications what we call a living documentation system. So we're 
we are focusing here on making sure we don't just treat each story as, a, as an item we ticked off a backlog, but instead we say that the result of each change that we make should be contributing towards a body of documentation that actually is, is living in the sense that it's always been updated, it's always sort of keeping pace with the evolution of our software, but it's also living in the sense that it's self-checking because it, it's comprised of executable specifications. So we know when there's a discrepancy or, a, or a, a regression or a drift away from what we say the system does versus what it's actually does. That's living in that sense. Okay, so over the course of this session, I'm going to examine through a couple of exercises uh, uh, the details of a few of these important patterns. We won't, be able, won't have time to do them all, but we'll sort of pick out the important ones. Um, so this first area of being able to derive our scope from business goals, there's a number of techniques that are useful here. Um, I'm just going to pick on one of them today sorts of things that we do. This is all sort of in the, in the field of, uh, you might say, stuff that happens to the, to the left of the script backlog. It's, it's all the things you do effectively as part of analysis, grooming, uh, understanding what the longer term projections are uh, uh, before you actually get down to items that you would consider to be story small enough to fit in the script. Um, so impact mapping, feature injection, these are all useful things. Story mapping is the one that I'm going to look at today, not because it's any better or worse than the others. I just thought, well, we don't have time to go through all of them. And you know, story mapping is, a, is a, a good, useful technique. It's fairly easy for people to, uh, uh, to get their heads around. And you know, arguably, it's, a, uh, it, it's the easiest one to sort of, uh, take away out of things. Um, in order to do so, though, uh, we're going to need to uh, introduce a domain that will be used through the rest of these explanatory exercises. And for our purposes, that's uh, the game of blackjack. So what I need you to do, um, the simplest way to do this is everyone just stands up because A, you'll get the oxygen to your head and then it'll be a, a simple sorting process. So you all have to stand up and start with um, Now, uh, there'll be a series of questions. So, if you've uh, ever, or well, you remain standing, if you've ever played either Blackjack, 21, or Pond 2, they're all card games. If that's not true of anyone, you can sit down. As long as you've played any of those games sometime in your life, you just remain standing. Good? Okay, a couple of you have never heard of 21, Pond 2, or Blackjack. Okay, fine. Um, uh, of those who are still standing, who would say that they're, you know, they would remember what the basic rules of Blackjack are? In terms of, well, you know, you must if you're more than 21, and you can hit, you can stand. You basically, you know, you'd, you'd roughly be able to explain that to someone. If that's not true, you can sit down. Okay, good. Now, uh, of the people that are still standing, this time I want you to raise your hand if you've been in a casino and played blackjack at a casino betting your own money. Okay, only one? All right, good. That means. I need everyone else to remain standing. And just um, stick, a, uh, stick a little pink one of these on you. Um, make it easier to identify you. And I'll get you to hand the others back for me. Thanks. Um, and sorry, the gentleman who did raise his hand, is that you? OK, so you do need a pink sticker, but I'm also going to ask you to come up in front. Here. <laughs> <laughs> so, the rest can sit down. Uh, I want you to come, come to the front. Get your, get your thing sticky on. Um, but it's all right, I'm not thinking on you because I'm thinking on you as well. <laughs> so, you'll need to stand up as well. So, your name is? Michael. Okay, Michael. So. Michael and Simon are going to help us through this exercise, okay, as our, as our resident blackjack experts. Um, so what I'm going to do is I just want to quickly distinguish between, say, a simple version of blackjack. Imagine it's our job to build uh, a game of blackjack that sort of follows all the casino betting rules. Um, but we want to start with a simple version rather than the full version. So. Um, 
on here I've sort of randomly stuck a bunch of sort of, well, pseudo-scope items. Some of these are rules, some of these are sort of things that happen in the game, like events. Some of them are just sort of general uh, things that you need to consider. Uh, and your job as a pair is to distinguish between a simple game of blackjack versus full game of blackjack. That you might sort of find when you see that. Okay, so all of these things should be familiar to you because you're self-identified as people who know what blackjack is. Um, so what I'm going to do is I just want you to put things above the line or below the line. So that's a simple game above that line, and that's the full game below the line. All right, but talk to each other and talk so that the audience can see it. Like maybe one of you come this side and one stay on the other side, so no one can see what the thought process is. And uh, fairly quickly sort them into things that would be included in a simple game and leave the other stuff below the line. I'm going to deal with them, but they're going to be invasive on the basic rule, even for simple games. I'm going to play it. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, so I already shuffled the pack one. Okay, so the shuffle, I put my money down. Put your money down, then you'll deal around if you want. Yeah. You can see the dealer's cards yeah. usually. You'll have two cards and yeah. then you'll have various choices when you, you know, when you, it comes around to you to bet. Okay. If you want to sip or get another card. Maybe. Yeah. So, so I've got effectively a, a, a setup where, where the, the sort of deal takes place. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then you say the player gets to do something. Player chooses their, their next action. Yeah. Okay. What happens after that? Um, then once all the players have done all finished their actions, yeah. the dealer follows his rules. Uh huh. Okay. And then you determine who won the boss. Okay. This is what I do with my Darren Brown thing, so I didn't influence you at all. There's a totally free choice of that. Um, okay, so if we treat each of those four sort of phases or stages of the, the game sequence, now I just want you to organise each of those elements into the right columns. <clears throat> So the ace is a little bit awkward, but yeah, I guess we can count that as it's sort of a setup thing. Oh. Well, I don't know if it's up to you. It's, a, <laughs> it's more of an underlying yeah. rule, isn't it? It applies yeah. both to the, the player and the dealer. But yes, okay, that's fine. Okay, and similarly with the things that are out of scope or, or in our full game, just make sure those are in the right. So insurance and splitting are things that a player can choose to do. And doubling, yeah. What is winning means push? Okay, so does the does the player win? Do they lose, or is it a push, or is it an equal thing? So that's the way that was intended. Is that's uh, that would sort of proceed, I guess, playing out winnings. So you need to do that whether you're betting or not, don't you? As you need to understand what is the outcome of the game. I should have to go there. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, so the only thing I might change there is I would say that's probably in the, in the dealer column, and that's definitely a game outcome type thing. Okay, and then we can do that sort of thing. Okay. So now we've got <coughs> we've got a second dimension to uh, what we're doing. Um, but we're still just saying it's either on the line or below the line. The purpose of story mapping is to help you take more control over your scope decisions by creating effectively as sparse a table as possible. We want to find some horizontal stripes that we can put through these stories where there's as little above the line as possible because we want to commit to as little as possible and still produce something that's useful. So here's the challenge now. We've already said, okay, all of those seven or so, um, uh, six, yeah, seven stories above the line are part of a simple game. But what if we sort of push the envelope even further and said, well, what's, what's an even simpler version? We've already dropped betting, we've already dropped multiplayer. player. Can we simplify that game even further? Sorry, same. <laughs> The problem of the ace, yes. I mean, the ace arguably is one of the most complex aspects of blackjack. The fact that its it, it's, it's behaviour changes depending on the rest of the cards in your hand. So if you drop that down, if you said that wasn't part of that first strike, what's your alternative? It's always one. Or it's always the other. Right. So you're going to choose what is the ace worth, and what would be the right choice. There? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> How many more votes? <laughs> okay, what's the advantages of choosing one? Simple. Okay, but is it any more simple than eleven? Can you argue on that basis? I'll take one place. I'll go eleven. Okay, why did you change one? Because we've already got one. Have you already got one? No. What, what card is one if it's not an ass? Uh, no, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, why did you think of it? Well, then we're going to get 21 and can't do that. Ah, yes, I think that's a good argument. So, yes, I would go with 
an ace is, is 11. And then we would say, um, probably it's a pretty important thing to come soon. Uh, but we can, yeah, we can effectively simplify the, the value of the ace. Now, um, what else could we do? Just, again, making something ultra simple. Chain out the wind loops. Well, here's the thing. The idea of a story map is that we, the reason we went through the, one of the phases is that we always want to find what is the last thing. What actually represents the outputs in our system. Because you'll see this with anything that you do when you're trying to understand what those sequences are. And you'll start with some kind of input, you'll have some kind of processing, and you'll have some kind of output. And it's very, very important to get to the output because that's where the value is in your system. So if we didn't do the output, we sort of, we'd be arguably not having a, a testable or a, or a shippable increment. And what you're trying to do with the story map, especially when you're looking at what is our first strike, is to understand what's the thing this, this system needs to do where I defer how well it does it. Okay, so we're trying to get to the what of the game, even if it means what it does is done pretty badly, but I'm going to incrementally improve how well it does the what. I always have to start with the what. Now, in a game, what's the what? what are the, what's the essence of a game, let alone a game of life? What's the thing that really has to happen for it to be called a game? We lose. Yeah, you don't want to be able to lose. So I think that is absolutely, you know, has to up and can't move. But potentially everything else could. Well, at least we'll, we'll test that theory. You can make the um, player not make sure it's either. Yeah, so if we said, okay, if we said the dealer and the player both, well, let's sort of keep these aligned. So now we're sort of looking at horizontal relationships here. Uh, and we'll say the ace is kind of paired up in that. And now we're sort of imagining a, a line across there. So what does that sort of game look like? We've said we've dealt two cards out each. We don't give the player any options. We don't give the dealer any options. But we do determine when lose or push. So does that work? It kind of does. It's, it's, yeah, it's kind of, and I call this pattern the, the sort of, you know, the system for your five-year-old. What, what is the version of your system that would just work such that a five-year-old would understand? If you're trying to teach blackjack to a five-year-old, what might you do? It's simply, okay, can you add up these cards? Who, who won? They randomly came out. It's a game. It's not very fun for very long, but it kind of, <laughs> but that's what I mean, you know. The funness of the game is a quality that we want to incrementally improve, but it still does what it does from the very beginning. And that's the thing that we're trying to get at when we're, we're, we're having our scope discussions. So, um, now, could the, uh, can we push down dealer can bust? Presumably we can bust if, we could do something like this. So we could say, well, a player can hit, but they don't bust. Could we do it that way around? It sort of doesn't really make sense. If you're going to let somebody take another card, there really has to be some limit to it. Otherwise, it's you know, otherwise it's the highest. <laughs> the highest hand win doesn't really doesn't really work, does it? So it sort of suggests bust needs to sort of become first. Also, there's another reason for that, isn't there? It's because I could, due to this choice here, the ace is eleven. It is possible. That I bust on the initial deal, isn't it? If I've got dealt two aces and we're saying they're both worth 11 and I've got 22, I'm bust. So, in order for the, if, if we're deferring the calculation of whether I bust or not, and I simply just want that rule of whoever has the higher hand value wins, then I need to make a special rule, which is that, well, 22, what am I doing with that? Or you know, two aces, is that. Is that a good hand or a bad hand? And you probably therefore have to be, make a conscious decision that, okay, 22 is not bust. And you put that into the early thing, and then as soon as you implement player busts, well, anything over 21 is a bust. So you would say, yeah, bust over 21, which is the, the problem. 
Now, the other thing that we would do as we're going through this is say, um, what are our horizontal relationships here? Now, just as you said, being able to include pay out the winnings sort of brings betting along with it. Um, uh, you can then sort of do that sort of relationship here. We can say, well, let's defer all this complex stuff like insurance splitting and doubling, and then say, as soon as I'm allowed to place a bet, I have to calculate that with it. So I've got a horizontal stripe there, and I can defer other sort of betting relationships here, I can defer all this later. I could decide, okay, I want to drop multiplier down and just have a single player betting game. The point of the map is that you'll get a lot of options that you need to sort of make explicit. And otherwise, these things, you remember if we've only ever got a, uh, uh, a sort of flat backlog, a, a list of stories, it's very hard for us to consciously see these relationships between these things we need to do. It's very hard for us to be able to uh, uh, make connections between you know, what, what does it give us when we reach this particular thing? All we've got is a sprint, you know, uh, where more and more stories are ending. But the story map allows us to see, okay, well, I've got a, you know, a sort of a simple line here that I could probably put some kind of description on. I've got another one there. Um, potentially, I could just deal, you know, treat that as a, another shippable increment. The point is we're trying to give ourselves as many options as possible for being able to say, I've still got something that, that is a nameable step up from what I had before. Okay, well thanks guys. We will uh, uh, utilize the outcomes of that. Um, essentially, that's what we created. <coughs> Those, those green lines that I started to draw, I mentioned uh, representing sort of uh, uh, logical collections or logical uh, groupings of the things that are above the line. And the key to a story map is to try and put some kind of meaningful name against those. Try to make them named milestones that sort of say, well, once we don't, when we, when we do this, what is it that we have? You know, what is the capability that we've reached, or what is the what is the thing that we can say this version or this this little increment actually gives us? And the idea of naming that is it forces you to challenge, you know, what that is defined as. If I just said, well, that's milestone one, or that's just you know release one, it's it's somewhat arbitrary what is above the line and what's below it. Whereas if you name it something meaningful, then you can start to challenge. Well, do I need all the three of those stories to achieve that? Or does one of these sort of need to go off the line? Can I, can I, yeah, you can have useful discussions around what moves up or what moves down. Um, and then, of course, your, the other uh, aspect you can put on this is that you can use it as a, as a you know, planning tool. So once you've got some kind of uh, uh, estimate against each of these and a reliable velocity of the team, you can actually say, well, based on our, our current velocity, uh, we're going to. Uh, reach these points by these sprints or these iterations. It's a separate matter how accurate that is, but the, the point of the matter is that you can be, this is a representation of time, and that will sort of shift uh, as you go through and replan your, uh, your work. Okay, so that's one way of using concrete examples of, of, of making explicit your choices about what is the business goal we need to achieve, and you know, it's things like, is it more important to get uh, betting out there so that we can monetize this, or is it more important that we just want a fun, free version that we can get to attract as many players as possible? Is multiplayer important? Are we trying to chase the sort of social betting market? You know, whatever those business goals might be, can be articulated and reflected in a story map in a more sensible way than, than a, a typical flat backlog. Um, <clears throat> okay, we're gonna move on to the next pattern. And that's uh, the idea of taking those stories, taking the scope of what we have for our, our next horizon, uh, and being able to specify collaboratively the details of what has to go into each of those stories. Um, so the, as I mentioned, two related patterns here. It's specifying collaboratively and illustrating using examples. 
And the idea is that we, we uh, take an item of scope, take a user story, and what we'll identify are the key examples associated with that. Um, and this activity, or this, this, this pattern, is you know, a, a, a low-tech activity. It's, as the name suggests, it's just about using collaboration, getting as many uh, different viewpoints uh, from the team, uh, from an implementation point of view, from a testing point of view, from a business point of view, at the very least, and getting those people together and saying, well, what are the, you know, what, what are the key aspects of what this needs to do? And try to identify what the key examples are that are going to be useful for uh, uh, creating a shared understanding. So we're going to do that now for just one rule out of, out of Blackjack. So there's one that we, uh, it was, uh, where did we go? Dealer hits until 17 or higher. That is a fairly sort of central rule in Blackjack. Um, and so we're going to use that as our, our first exercise. So I need you to self-organize for this. Um, I've got whiteboard sheets. I don't really care how large the groups are, but I would suggest three is good, four is probably the limit. So all I want is that you spread yourselves out into groups no larger than four, and I want someone with a pink sticker on them to be included in every group, okay? So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six whiteboard sheets up. As I said, we may not need to use all those given this, uh, uh, the size of the room. We've got uh, two, three, five, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. There's only 15 people, so you know, uh, uh, five groups of three is probably, probably a good arrangement. Okay, so can I get you to self organize at those whiteboard sheets? There's a whiteboard pen by each of them. And what I want you to do is find the key examples that illustrate that rule. I'm not going to give you any more steer than that because part of the exercise is to see how you approach it. Can you find it? Okay, so introduce yourselves. There's a whole pattern somewhere near you. There's ones sitting down there. You get the lucky ones with a little eraser on the end. You guys don't know. Please, please, please be careful not to go out to the boundaries of your whiteboard. I will be crucified if uh, you draw on the walls here. That's hence the big red boundaries. <laughs> so, take, take a few minutes during that and then we'll compare how you're going after the uh, Start. What I always do when doing this exercise is, is 
is an echo of the way I recommend that you try this if you're doing this in your own work environment. Rather than have the group of people who say, right, well, we're going to try this collaborative specification for the first time, let's all get around the whiteboard and work it out, split the group up. Split the group as, as far as the group will sustain it, even if it's just split into two groups, and get people to work on it independently. Now, I intentionally didn't give you any steer on what your example should look like. I just said find key examples, all right? Now, what I like to do is therefore compare how different groups approach that, uh, uh, that problem. And almost always there'll be variation in there. So I want to very, very quickly just get you to look at what the other, other teams have done. And not to spend too long on the, 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 the choices they've made, the examples, it's literally how would you parse their data, how have they structured their examples. So these two, maybe it's a coincidence because they're close together, have almost identical. I think they've just been copying each other. Okay? But they crossed out their 10 and 6 hit and they started with 10 and 7 stick, which is uh, what these guys did. But anyway, fairly obvious, it's just um, a sequence of cards. Interestingly, show, one example showing more than two cards, uh, and then a slightly interesting answer here. So they're saying they draw two, in the other cases they, they, they stick, okay, so I understand that. It looks like that team were doing something similar, but yours, I guess, is your is your structure a bit similar? Is it just hit or stick? Is that really what? Just to ask you, can I like you can show the draw rather than just having two cards? Okay, okay. Uh, pause there. What, what did this team do? You did a similar thing. Uh, a pair of cards looks like a value here, and whether you hit or not as a as a true or false. Okay, I like that. Uh, what did you guys eventually reach? <laughs> We've only got one example, and uh, this is the current set of cards. Yep. I realized I've changed the main language there. Ah, yes. Okay. Uh, that, that is an important thing. Yeah. We do want to stick to, uh, there, there's me saying stick. <laughs> I'm already influenced by it. Uh, we want to use the domain language, or uh, use it consistently. You know, the thing of this uh, is writ large in domain driven design and all those sorts of things. You want to find a ubiquitous language that, that persists through your examples and can end up in your code, using the tests, the specifications, everything. So whatever is the right term, well, whatever the terminology that your product owner or stakeholder selects is the one you should go for. So I'm going to make it, these guys are good because they're quite hit, so they've avoided the whole um, st uh, stick or stand problem. Uh, but I'm going to say if you, your choice is a hit or stand, okay? But maybe do what these guys did these guys did, it's, it's hit, yes or no. So let's stick with that. Okay, and let's quickly look at the guys in the cozy corner here. So you've got a title there, get a still something or higher, and then how do I, how do I interpret the rest of your, your data there? So, so the numbers in sequence of the cards that you've been dealt, yep. so you're summing the you're going on, and put it in the or higher, so I thought stop, but I guess in your terminology that's that stand. Okay, so is it fair to say that in that example, when I had the two and the three, I hit, and then I had the two and the three and ten, I hit, yep. and then I had the two and the three and ten and two, I didn't hit. Yep. That's really what that's, that's showing. Yep. Okay. And for your ten, eight, and nine, nine, because each of those are above 17, there's, there's, there's nothing else there. So that's kind of the way you're, yep. you're representing that. So that's very common. I, I, I often see, and I've already and often see them do this, and it's sort of like, you know, often put arrows or something, and things like that. Um, it's it's not uncommon. The thing is, the thing that surprised me is that nobody chose is the thing. Nobody chose to work over here, and that was the trap I was hoping to lay. What I always do, I always put one white or cheat up the landscape, and almost always this is the group that uses that style. You know, it says, well, I, I have these two cards, and I draw an arrow, and I get this, and I hit, and I do this. There's something about the cue. The very subtle cue of the way the media medium is represented that influences the way we represent it. Everyone else ends up with much more columnar things because I put it portrait. So just be conscious of those sorts of things. It was interesting that, that uh, in this case I couldn't attribute it to the, the shape of the <laughs> of the whiteboard, but because it happens so often, it, it makes me sort of always stress, be very careful of the kind of tools you might use. Always use 
the most fluid thing, which is a whiteboard in this case. Uh, if you start to use Excel or anything like that, thinking that it will be quicker and neater and faster, you'll be so biased by the restrictions or the, the, uh, say the, the, uh, the constraints of that tool that it will unduly influence what you, what you do. Okay, what I'm going to do is get us to synchronize now on a single style so that we can focus on what is the best, what are the best examples, what are the best you know, things to actually put in there. So, um, what's the relative merits of these? The, the most different one was the one in the corner. So we're going to get the group to comment on what is, what is good or bad about the ones that the people in the corner used, compared to your own, for example. Complexity. Complexity, okay. So what's your, what's your, what's your idea? Well, that it's um, kind of layering up the examples, really. Uh, whereas, you know, you, you got probably a few examples, but then these examples are more complicated because it's shown that you've got a progression of cars, whereas you can have more examples, but they're more discreet. Yeah, okay, so what would be the solution? I mean, they, they created quite a good example of sort of, you know, the player or the, sorry, the dealer hitting a couple of times. What would be the alternative to that in your format, for example? I think it's that example to illustrate the kind of game flow as opposed to the, this is about a number that you get to, regardless yes. of how you got there. Yes. I would tend to agree with that. Okay. And, and they would argue, well, isn't that what you did in your... That's exactly what I was going to say. Yes. What's, what's different about your fourth example to our top example? It's funny or well. That would be the car. The thing is, well, that, I mean, that's, that's, that's not, that's not, I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's in blue. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I think that what the, the argument is trying to get to here is that yes, you can, you can effectively decompose that style into this by saying, well, yeah, 2, 3, 5, and 7 is, uh, is actually a span, whereas 2, 3, 5 is a hit. And you can sort of draw the conclusion from that. Yeah, and you can draw it again. So, and, and if you want to complete the same, two and three, it's also a hit. So, yes, you can achieve the same amount of information, but yeah, I think I would, I would support the sort of complexity argument, is that what we want these to end up being is testable cases, and therefore we want to make it a reasonably simple sort of state of, well, given these cards in the hand, what is the action that needs to be uh, returned by the do I hit calculator? So, um, now what about the embellishment of uh, these guys? They, they've got the same style with one little extra column in here. Do we like that or not? Well, we did, that's what we like. Obviously, that team likes it. Yeah. Um, so, whenever I see something extra, I mean, I like the fact that you've got headings on your, on your um, elements here, but there isn't a heading over those numbers. So, uh, last minute addition. It was really just the, the total of the, the cards, just to help illustrate the point. Right? Okay. So, um, what about? Uh, I also always like to see uh, what I call signs of battle, where there's evidence that you've changed something in the process. Now, this is another tip. Uh, even though it is, we are using whiteboard pens, and, and you've got fancy ones that have little erasers on the end. Uh, I always recommend don't rub things out cross them out and write something else next to it. Another tip is give everyone a whiteboard then and try to maximize the number of colors. And that will really highlight how much dispute or discrepancy was there amongst different people in your team around particular areas. If it was just a basic thing of, oh, that was a bad idea, get rid of it. But if it's, well, somebody had 12, I think it was, under, under 22, and then you changed it to 22, that's a really interesting point of, of discussion. So what was the, the logic here, or what, what, what are people's thoughts on whether that's correct or not? For me, the original the idea was, was a while ago, or the idea that Ace was either one or one or eleven, and we decided that we were talking about a simple game, which gets it had to be eleven. Let's say two aces became twenty-two. Okay, so um, that, that's a good rationale, but I'm going to make an executive decision that no, by the time we've done this, uh, we've actually beefed that up. We said we couldn't tolerate that simplistication rule for that long, and therefore these examples need to treat the ace correctly. 
Okay. So what would be the correct answer there? Uh, well, that would be to 12 and it would be here. Yes. Okay. Um, so it's a more important thing actually, and I think some of them might have said it, it's actually relevant what the cards come to. Yes. Because, so, because what you could say is if your total, the total of the cards that you've been dealt to date is less than 17, the result is hit. Yes. And that's ultimately the specification. Indeed. And uh, uh, the other uh, thing is total cards dealt to date. Because that gets rid of the sequencing issue that gets we have. That's right, so you're right, and that's why I think mean, that, that sort of you know, uh, fully factored out uh, version sort of gets around it because yeah, we don't really care how we end up with two, three, five, and seven. It's just if those are the cards in your hand, then this is this is the action I hit or not. So we could almost sort of say, yeah, just imagine it's a it, it's a set or it's an array of numbers. Uh, put, put commas between them or something. We, we don't care how many are, are there or as you say, how you got them. It's just saying this is a finite state thing. If those are the cards I've got, my action is hit or not. But you raise the point of well. And this, it sort of hints at by here of what really the relationship is between that number and, and 17 as to whether I hit or not. And a lot of people start this exercise saying, well, okay, my examples are less than 17, hit, equal 17, stand, above 17, stand. And I say, okay, well, you know, if I'm testing that, what's, what, what's a, what can I put in here? Can I put in minus 5? You know, can I put in 40? You know, what's, uh, what are the, those, those are valid examples of less than 17 or above uh, 17, but they're not valid hand values. So if we you know, imagine, okay, I guess the next question is, how many examples do we need if we start to shift our focus to what is the, um, uh, how good are the examples we chose, what's the rationale within there? So I can see some similar examples. I can see 10 and 7 is a common thing. 10 8, yeah, 10 and 6. Now these are, these are common examples because they're at the boundaries. It's fairly natural for people to tend towards, okay, well, if I want to illustrate this rule, I should be illustrating at the boundaries. So that's fairly common. And interestingly, you guys chose quite different to that. Was there any thought behind that? So this was equivalent to partition. So this was a less than 17 value. Okay. Okay. So your next one would have been an uh, above 17. Yeah, and I'd have probably done the boundaries. Yeah. So um, when we, you know, if we think we can go through this process, and once we've even agreed what our structure is, we can uh, uh, we can spin up clearly a huge number of possible examples. And people start to ask the question, well, I'm going to get bored because there's, there's a zillion combinations I could, I could put here. And that's quite intentional. That's why it's also one sheet of, you know, in this case, A1 a paper um, to do your examples. Because if you want to do 100, chances are these are not going to be very interesting examples. So that's why the pattern, or the, the outcome of this pattern, is to create the key examples. So we need to sort of start to make a value judgment about what are good examples versus bad examples. That's the other reason why it's useful to think of them examples and not, say, tests or test cases. Because you generally don't think in terms of, oh, that's a good test case or a bad test case. It's just a test case, if you're interested in it at all. Whereas if it's an example, you can say, oh, that's a good example. You know, well, that's a less interesting example. Or here's a better example than that one. It's easier for you to think in those terms because it's, it's almost a subconscious, how close is this example to the stuff that matters in terms of the business rules. So um, what I want to do is, uh, yeah, you've got good examples there. I want to see whether any, any other interesting cases needed to come out. Uh, sorry, yes, you are hiding a couple of these here. So what's interesting in here? So 10 and 6. Oh yes, you took the whole sort of set in very, very quickly. Sure, that's good. <laughs> um, and what does that say? What is that? Ten, three, and three. Yeah. Okay. So just another example of sixteen, uh, and then a seventeen, and another example of that looks like sixteen to me. Yeah. So mm. I don't know. Well, trying to listen to what you were saying. I was going to call it drawings. That's that. In this case, we know what the mean of magnitude would be. Yes. 
So the min will be two, the max will be. Okay, hold that thought. So yeah, if we just said what are the minimum and maximum values, um, or if I said, if I put it this way, if I said that um, let's label yours. I'm going to call this. Uh, we need to choose our domain terms, but I'm going to call this hang back. Um, if we're allowed to treat hand value as a sort of first order domain object or domain concept, how easy would the illustration of this rule be? So I, I, you know, I, I forced you to say give me concrete examples of dealer hits in terms of cards, but if I said do that in terms of hand value, how much simpler does this become? Much. Yeah. So if I said, well, Given a hand value and a hit answer, what would be the examples I need that are the key examples? 260. Wow, well, 2. Interesting. Well, you could say 227. Yeah. And you just yeah. itemize all of them, would you? And so I'd expect something like um, uh, a yes to that. A no to that, and then I'd have an interesting boundary or something here, right? 16, 17. That's sort of our key boundary. What do people think of that? Firstly, challenge it. Well, so I, sorry, so I some of the rules don't change. Okay, well, you're also the one who put it correctly and realized, okay, we've got a minimum and maximum possibility here. Is that the minimum? If I call me one of them. Well, that's the assumption that you've got two cards. Well, yes, I, that is my assumption because I can't have less than that. And also, I'm assuming the, the correct use of the H rule. So, whenever we, we put these on, we think, okay, if I am allowed to use hand value as a valid input, if I'm allowed to call that a, 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 a first order domain entity, I would need examples that show how I correctly calculate that hand value. So imagine I had let you go on for another 10 minutes and you sort of filled up your page with examples. That, that wouldn't be wasted because I would simply get you to refactor it to say, well, instead of the answer being do I hit or not hit, it would look a lot more like this team. We should say, given these cards, what is my hand value? So can we have an example of a hand value of that? What did you want? Really? Ace, ace, two aces would be 12. Well, I see your example says ace, ace is 22. Uh, okay. Some debate is the word was 12. <laughs> you see what I mean? That, that this forces us to say, okay, well, actually, that's not a, you know, what is the smallest hand value? That's a four. It is four. Uh, and similarly, 27, what do we think of the, an upper end? Is that is that our maximum? Some, some people would say thirty. Where did twenty-seven come from? Do I understand twenty-seven? Sixteen plus an eight. Okay, yes. So so that's based on the idea that you could get to sixteen and still have to take another card. Oh, sorry. And you took an ace, but uh, that's actually seventeen. So you could take get to sixteen and get a ten. And so on this logic, twenty-six is the is the highest because remember an ace would count as one in that case because you know the, the rule is you don't count the ace as eleven and four make it bust. Okay. So, um, but do we do we like twenty six as a as a maximum? Since that's bust, twenty two is also bust. Now, is twenty six more bust than twenty two? It's not really for for the rules of the game. It doesn't really matter how bust you are. The, the bust status of your hand is the important thing. So we can say, well, let's just not call that 26, and let's just say, well, I get down to 21, and I have bust as a, as a potential hand value. And if that's what my business owner talks about, then that's a valid thing. You know, my, you know, I says, well, hang on, but let's fit into an integer. 
You say, well, tough luck. If, if bust is a valid handle here, your system has to handle that. And so it makes us think, OK, well, maybe this idea of hand value is something a little more complex than just a number. So what's another? Uh, so we can have various examples. So you could add, keep your ASA there, but just put, uh, let's choose them. We have two really interesting examples. Please put up uh, 10, 6, ace. And then below that, 10, 6, 10. Okay, so we agree the answer. The first one is 17, 10, 6, 10. But 10, 6, and 10 is bust. Now there's one more interesting hand value that we need in our list. So these are all fine. 20, 18, 19, 20, 21. What's a special value that's like 21? Blackjack. Yeah. So blackjack is also a hand value. So where's okay? So there's an example of that up there. So why why is that? Why is 10 and 8 not 21? Or if it's not 21, what's an example that is 21? So an example 21 would be 10, 6, 5. Excellent. Please put that one up. So, and now let's refactor 10 and ace to say blackjack, or just BJ if you like. Good. Now we're getting closer because now we're saying that for our simple table that is just about dealer hits to 17 or higher, we include all the possible values from a minimum up to our sort of maximum, if you think of bust as a maximum. Uh, and if we wish, we could put all those values in between. As I say, it's not, it's not a huge number, so it's, it's manageable, but we can sort of see that it's a fairly boring pattern from 4 to 16. Um, and then we could argue, okay, yeah, all of these are Bust is a no, black check is a no, 21 is a no, etc. Now the very fact that I've drawn it like that suggests that 16 is a more interesting example than 12. 4 is a more interesting example than 5. Uh, black check and bust are both interesting examples. They probably both justify their, their place in this set of examples. What I really want is for each example, each set like this to end up with Roughly that, you know, that sort of seven plus or minus two range of key examples that sort of fit neatly in my head as being the best examples I can think of to illustrate this rule. And then similarly, we could sort of, and it's a little harder for hand value because there are lots of interesting cases that lead to those, but you might partition those. You might say, what are good examples of leading to bust? Or what are the examples of blackjack? Uh, what are the examples of 21 versus blackjack? Those would be good things to pair together. <coughs> so it's this idea of sort of partitioning <coughs> my domain concepts by virtue of having explored the examples. That's one of the sort of key things that we're doing in this exercise, is getting a better understanding of what it is that our, you know, we're, we're modeling our system essentially. That's what we're doing. So the, the examples are really far more than just tests or more than just sort of uh, documentation, they are, they are, you know, examples of the model. Yes. Very simple. We've got a look here with the blackjack in particular box. It wasn't boss one of the other um, parts of the system we were going to model. We haven't actually just modeled ah, that first. Yeah, yeah good point. So, so that's right. So we would, you know, if we are deferring being able to bust when we when we have the dealer hits until 17, then yeah, we need to say what. Uh, what is valid, but I, uh, firstly, I think that would be part of our analysis that would say you know, it doesn't make sense that you let the dealer hit if the dealer can't go bust. So instead, you, you, therefore, being able to bust would have to proceed in our, in our implementation priority, uh, the notion of being able to hit us there. But no, or, or indeed, it, 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 would, it would be together. That is, if you do the hit story, you kind of have to deal with bust as, as part of it. 
Okay. Now the how we get it time. No, we better we better conclude that one there then. So I know it was only a very, very brief little exercise to do that, but as I say, the important things is, you know, what are the what are the consequences of what you do? So one of the key points is is um, when you do this kind of exercise, spread your uh, group uh, into multiple groups, and uh, I call it divide and concur. So you divide yourself up, let let yourself go. Don't don't sort of don't, don't, don't confer or don't insist on a common style, but then look at each other's style and try to find the best elements of each of them. Critique what's good or bad about each of them, and find okay, let's concur on a common format and then move forward with that. That way you can focus, you, you quickly move from trying to understand the structure of your examples to what are the good examples versus the, or what are the more interesting versus the less interesting examples. Wouldn't this also tell you whether your domain definitions are actually good domain definitions? Yes, absolutely. And it's also often where new domain concepts sort of burst into life uh, because we need to be able to name something in order to address a point of complexity. This is another thing that Eric Evans says, is whenever you've got complexity in your system, it's usually because there's a, a, a hidden domain concept waiting to come out. And so for us, it was being able to talk about hand value drastically simplified or allowed us to fan in all our possible cards into a simple, a very small range of possible values. But then having understood those values well and having discussed what, what really does a hand value mean and, and get that really tightened down, allows us to say, okay, now that's a useful thing to be able to uh, 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 use in this, and imagine the next exercise I could give you would be, okay, what about the game outcome? Now that, again, that would be a nice simple thing to say, well, if it's really a comparison of the hand value between the dealer and the hand value of the player. So again, that, that would become an input to a set of examples that said, well, in this case, you get a, a win or a lose or a push, uh, or indeed, you get this payout based on a, a given bet. So the, the uh, emergence of those concepts are what comes out of this. In fact, uh, I'll show you that in a, in a second because we did a few examples of, yeah, we did a few examples of aces. That's usually where, if I'm doing the longer version of this exercise, people will tend to gravitate around aces and you see lots of <laughs> really sometimes quite weird uh, sets of examples of, of ace behavior because it is arguably the, the most complex part of calculating the hand value. Okay, thanks for your indulgence. I'll let you sit down. Um, <coughs> so, returning to our um, overall patterns, we've been through the top end, we specified collaboratively, we illustrated with examples to end up with key examples. and. Those key examples were really just, you know, stuff on the whiteboard as we've done here. Um, but obviously that in itself was usable for sort of making sure everyone, you know, a few light bulbs went off without understanding what we were talking about. But it's not particularly good for long-term documentation. So really the next pattern is about refining that into a specification supported by examples. Um, so yeah, given just as we had here, some, some whiteboard stuff involving aces and maybe some notes about you know, clarifying our understanding of what we've just done as we went through that collaborative exercise, we should be able to turn that into something that sort of is, is dressed up a little more neatly uh, for, the, for the rest of the organization or for other stakeholders who might be interested in it, such that it provides some long-term value. So um, we touched on the idea of, well, this is where your domain concepts come out. We talked about hand value. Another one that's related to aces is the idea of whether your hand is soft or hard. Um, uh, and the reason that's important is that there are, you know, certain casinos will play a variation on the dealer hits until 17 ball, which says the dealer can hit a soft 17. That is, if the dealer has a, a hand value of exactly 17, but that comprises an ace that's counted as 11, then they can draw, it, or they must draw another hand if that rule is, is in place. And so, you know, we can dedicate a whole set of examples in our specification, in our refined specification, that deal specifically with that. So we have uh, a, a title about what this is about, and then you kind of, what's the phrase you put into Google to, to arrive at this? It's your short uh, heading, like soft hand. You've got just some basic plain language text 
describing what the rules are or describing any kind of background. And you're saying, okay, well, here, are, here are the examples that support it. Uh, in this case, we've got the same format that we had here, one set of inputs, which is the cards in our hand. The output is the hand value, but an additional uh, expected output is uh, whether it's soft or hard. And then we've just, in this case, put some notes against each of those examples to, to you know, state why we think that's a, that's a good example or what that example has shown. So this is what I would call the refined specification. It's just the, the, the progression away from the, the, the quick sort of set of examples on a whiteboard into something that actually can stand up as, as some long-term documentation. Um, what we want to do with that specification of examples, though, is you know, the, I guess the hard bit of BDD and SBE, and it's often the bit that people leap into without really focusing on all this stuff that sort of, you know, ought to have happened before that, which is just, okay, how do I automate this into tests? I mean, get this into something like Cucumber or whatever. And focusing too heavily on that without really thinking about, well, have I really done this and have I really got those and am I really creating one of these? That can be a bit of a danger. However, let's, uh, let's look at this, this transformation of this particular pattern. The pattern is about automating the validation of our specifications without changing. And that sort of that clause that without changing the specification is the important part. So, um, what we're trying to show here is that, okay, I mean, it was a different example, but you get, you get it, it's all in the um, uh, blackjack domain. So here's our specification. In this case, this page is about the game outcome, as we just mentioned. So the relationship between the dealer's hand value and the player's hand value. What is the outcome? Is it a win for the player, or a lose for the player, a push, uh, or something else? But notice that we've got these things color-coded because in this case, we've uh, uh, put our um, specifications into a framework that supports it. This particular example is FitMass, but there's lots of others, that other choices that do the same thing. Um, so that it's comparing what does the specification say versus what the system actually does, given exactly that data. So here, each of these rows is a separately verifiable case that says, okay, if the player's hand value is 20, the dealer's hand value is 19, if I plug those data values into the system, does it, in fact, say that the outcome is a win? If so, just highlight that cell in green because it's what we expected. But here we've got a difference between what was expected. So the spec said, you expected that if the player has a bust and the dealer has a bust, uh, you said that should be a push. The system is treating that as a lose for the player. Now, in fact, the system in this case is correct. <coughs> uh, if, you've, if you bust, the dealer eventually busts, unfortunately, you still lost. But it might be that th this is an interesting sort of bit around the edges, but it might be that, well, okay, for our free version, for the non-money-based game, maybe we would rather increase the odds in favor of the player so that over time they believe they're winning more often than they're losing. So maybe we would treat that as a push and not a lose. It's only when they upgrade to the paid version we say, okay, well, in the fine print, here's the real rules. So these, these examples around the edges of what's important is, is exactly the, the definition of what are the key examples that we need to uh, illustrate when we do these things. Um, I'm sorry there's lots of words here, but I felt that with this particular pattern, it's often easier to uh, highlight what we mean by that by showing the kind of anti pattern that are more commonly in place. Um, so, Imagine that we've done everything that we did in the, sort of in the, you know, the, the first part of our, our patterns cycle. And imagine we got to having a, a good collaborative workshop. We had different points of view in the room. We had testers, we had developers, we had business people there. And we nothing it out and got a good set of examples. And then we go away from that and we start doing some of these anti patterns. So it might be that we just say, okay, that's fine, I can automate those tests, I'm going to put them all in, in JUnit. Um, or it might be that uh, the tester says, well, okay, yeah, that was useful, but I'll, you know, when it comes to testing, when you, when you finish the work, then I'll, I'll do some acceptance tests for that. Um, or you're uh, using a tool that sort of means that your acceptance tests are only visible to 
people who are licensed to use this tool, and that's just the test department, something like that, and nobody else ever dares go near it um, because it's awful. Um, or so much time has passed that we, you know, we actually didn't bother taking the things that we believe were the key examples from these workshops, and instead the testers are arbitrarily choosing their own values. So we could have much less interesting examples in our testing. And you know, the other end of that is, well, our product owner can't see any of these tests because none of them are expressed in the framework that actually allows you to examine what the intention of the test is. Uh, and so they don't know whether the things that we agreed from these things or the things that were written down are really still the case. In other words, you know, we're, we're relying on documentation, however carefully created and, and nicely presented, uh, it's still just a snapshot in time, and unfortunately the system can drift away from that. We don't have any warning because it's just a, a word document. Um, the mechanism by which we automate the validation of these uh, specifications is a fairly simple set of relationships. Uh, it does depend, I guess, in the details of the depend on what type of framework you're using. Once again, these examples happen to be fitness, uh, but the principle is that it's actually the same if you're using Spectre or Qcamper or whatever. Um, essentially, you've got a relationship between three different entities. There's the visible part, you know, the, the, the test table, or it's, it's mostly a table, or it's a given when then scenario or something like that, but it's the, it's the expressive part of the test, the bit that is meaningful to people, describes what the test is, is doing, doesn't focus on how it's automated or how it's implemented. That visible part needs to be supported by fixture code. It needs to be the, the this is the, the glue or the, the, the automation that sort of makes it work. And that's really just a, as, as simple as possible, a set of pass-throughs, <coughs> excuse me, to the application on the test. So our domain code is just what it is, it's, it's the thing that does what it does, it's the thing that works out should we take another car or not. Uh, the test fixture is not production code, but it's what's necessary to allow these data values to be compared, you know, to, to be pumped into the system under test. And you can see that if I've got a system model that does not really line up very nicely against my test or specification model, then this fixture has to do a lot of work. It's got to do the translation between what the test is talking about and start speaking the language of the system under, under test. And that's a bad thing. You don't really want to have to give yourself a lot of work here making complex fixture code. So there's an incentive to make sure that our representations of examples and tests nicely line up with the actual model of the system that's being tested. That's why it's very important this is a collaborative process, an iterative process. If you attempt to say, why don't we just go through the specification document, and we get to write out all the examples of that, and then we hand that into the dev process, and that will eventually come down to the test process. That generally won't work. You do need to make sure that there's enough uh, <coughs> cyclic influence, if you like, enough backwards feedback, such that as we evolve our domain model, as we evolve the system under development, that allows us to think more clearly about you know, what is the uh, what is the system, uh, yeah, what, what is the our, our model of the system, such that future discussions, future uh, examples and collaboration workshops are building upon the existing model of the system. That is our mental model that the business users talk about is neatly reflected in the underlying system model. And if we can achieve that, then this fixture code remains nice and thin, not complicated, and you know, not subject to, to nasty bugs. Um, we're nearly at the end. <clears throat> so the last thing is, how do we get from executable specifications to living documentation? Well, the way we do that is through evolving a documentation system iteratively as we go. Um, and it has to be said, this is arguably the hardest 
pattern to achieve. You know, there were, and, uh, we visit a lot of teams and those that you know, are really uh, at a position where you can say they've got living documentation and something they've achieved, they've spent several years getting there and they've usually failed several times as they've worked towards this, this goal. But if you start with your, you start with an understanding of living documentation as being your objective, that will help you make better decisions in these kind of near-term things as you're applying perhaps pieces of this, this process uh, cycle or thinking on particular patterns. If you're always thinking in terms of would this stand up as living documentation, you know, if I visited this in six months' time, or if somebody who wasn't here in the room started to read out the output of what we came up with, would it make sense? If you think in those terms, then you know, you'll, you'll, you'll find you improve those artifacts. So an important uh, uh, concept to, to lead towards this is understanding the distinction between the things that are short-lived artifacts and those that are long-lived artifacts. And uh, each, you know, we should not be too uh, story-centric. In an agile process, we want to find you know, nice, small, regular stories that we can sort of you know, get a consistent flow out of. That's a, that's a good thing. But you've got to be careful not to assume that, well, I just need to attach examples to each story and then I'm done. I do specification by example. It's because the story itself is really just about one chain, one brush stroke, if you like, in the painting that we're creating. What we want is documentation to be the painting. It's the effect of all those brush strokes. It's the, it's the, 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 the thing at a point in time that is the overall picture, whether it's just an early sketch or whether it's something more mature. So each change we make, <coughs> each story we implement, can have an associated specification to tell us that we've, you know, whether we're doing this right or not. But really, they are logically separate things because the specification remains as a, as a, a long-term artifact Whereas the story is just a temporary thing that's done and gets tipped off and you tear up the card and so forth. So these, each of these things really sit in close relationships. So the story is about the change, the spec is about documenting the effect of the change. Each story should have acceptance criteria that tells you when that story is done. And that will include automated tests that will live on as regression tests in the overall uh, suite uh, of our system. And similarly, anything that we document associated with a given story, we need to be able to pick that information out and you know, piece it together in, in the appropriate place in our living document <coughs> system. And I've put wiki on here just because that's, a, that's a, a, a common format, that whatever it is, it needs to be the, uh, say, the, the long-term picture. Don't attempt to use Jira or something like that for living documentation, because it's just a, a collection of tasks and, and statuses. Okay, oh, I should have zoomed in on that, shouldn't I? Uh, that is my overall patterns, and miraculously, that's us pretty much on time. So thanks very much, but if we've got a few minutes for questions, if there are any, otherwise you get first dibs of the coffee and cake things too. Okay, thanks very much for attending.